Welcome to Hot Chips 24. Session 2. Fabrics and Interconnects. And this is the Fabrics and Interconnect session. The first talk is by Ron Draslinski. Uh, it's called Sizzle Switch, a self-arbitrating high radix crossbar for NOC systems. And uh, Ron received his PhD in 2011 from the University of Michigan, and he's currently a research faculty member at the University of Michigan with a research focus on low power computing and interconnect technologies. Okay, so the, the title of my talk is Swizzle Switch. It's uh, really what we're trying to look at, and this is a series of three chips that we taped out at the University of Michigan, is the scalability of crossbars and how they're moving uh, and how they're growing as we're going on. Um, and so there's a number of systems. We keep growing the numbers of cores and the number of things on uh, system on a chip designs. And uh, in industry and in academia, we've started looking at other things besides crossbars, rings, buses, and now network on chip topologies. And we really wanted to go back and say, if we really focused on a crossbar, how far could we take that? And so I'm Ron Draslinski. This is some work done with uh, a number of my colleagues at the University of Michigan. And so my talk today is broken up into two pieces. Uh, the first part is on the swizzle switch itself, so the, the chip that we've uh, taped out and tested and I'm gonna talk about how it works. And then the second half of the talk, we take that uh, design that we taped out and we simulate how it would work in a 64 core system. And so we look at you know, cache coherence and management there and, and look at its performance uh, in that set. And so I'll start by kind of giving the, the general overview of the swizzle switch. And so um, what I've drawn here on the top left is a conventional matrix style crossbar where inputs come in from the, the left and right side of the crossbar and outputs are located in the, at the bottom. And there's a set of arbitration and control that's uh, associated with the crossbar. When a request comes in, a decision needs to be made on which input is granted to a particular output, and then some control signals are routed into the crossbar itself to designate where connections are made. Now, conventionally, these uh, crossbars don't scale well because they're quadratic in nature, and what we're gonna try to do is not improve the fact that they're quadratic, but try to shrink the coefficient in front of the quadratic. And so we, we start looking at swizzle switch, which is uh, on the right here. The first observation we made was that the, the matrix crossbar itself is very wire dominated. There isn't much logic internally. It's just a, basically a pass transistor that's connecting the inputs to the outputs. And then the arbitration, which is sitting on the outside, is uh, very heavy in terms of logic. And so we tried to fold those together and embed the logic that does the arbitration underneath the cross points in the matrix crossbar. Uh, the second thing we did was uh, we reused some of our input wires and our output wires to do our arbitration. So we cut down on, you can see the red signals coming in from the arbitration control, we cut down on the number of wires going into and out of the, the crossbar by using the wires for dual purposes. And then we take uh, SRAM style optimizations. We, we leverage the fact that this is laid out in a very particular pattern and we design a, a cell and we replicate the cell over and over and we use bit line uh, pre-charging and then sense amplifiers at the output to reduce kind of the, the low, you know, create a low swing change in the crossbar. And so that helps with speed and for power. And uh, it, it then provides us a, an ability to scale crossbars further than we, we have in the past. And so that's kind of the top level picture of, of what the swizzle switch is. I'm gonna to try to break down a little bit internally how we do this arbitration and control uh, within the swizzle switch. I won't go into the circuit level details, they're in the, the end in the appendix of the slide so you can see the actual circuits that are involved. Um, the first is just looking at data routing within the system. So I've plotted again kind of this matrix crossbar and I've got source inputs on the left in green and then the destination where it's going at the bottom in gray. And there's a path from inputs to outputs wherever a, a bit is stored with a one at a cross point. And so then I dynamically pre-charge the output bit lines 
and I only discharge the, you know, that particular bit line on the output bus if the data I'm trying to transmit says to discharge it, and if there's a one stored at that local cross point saying that input is connected to that particular output. Now, with this style configuration, you can also do broadcasting, where you could set a one in all the bits across one horizontal row, so one input broadcasts all outputs, or you could do multicasting, just a subset of the bits are set. Uh, the only restriction is that only one input can talk to a particular output at a time, so that means there can only be one one value in any particular vertical column. Okay, so I'm going to zoom out a little bit uh, on that, and well, I'm going to pull that down to the side and zoom in on one particular output column to kind of talk about what the data structures are underneath here. So right now it looks like just a, a bit that's storing whether things are, are moving or not. In reality, we're also keeping track of priorities. So we're going to create a system in which uh, we can give least recently granted priority to that particular output column. And so I've zoomed in on just the middle output column here. And what you can see is that at each of these cross points, so if you look, request K, R-E-Q-K, at the top there, represents that first gray box with a zero. It stores in that one piece a zero for the data that's there, and then a set of bit vectors which designate the priority. And I'll show in a couple of slides how those priorities are used to do LRG. Uh, the key takeaway is that any time you have you know, a one, that gives you priority over somebody else. So the request with the highest priority in this example is request M, because all the bits in its priority vector are one, and the request with the least priority is request K, because all of its bits are zero. Okay. So I'm going to talk now about how arbitration is actually achieved uh, in the swizzle switch. And so again, we're going to zoom in on just that one output column. And so the, the first thing to, th to see is this is a single output column. Each of the output columns operate independently. So they're either in one of two modes, arbitration, where they're trying to decide who's getting the output next, or they're doing data transmission. And so each output can be either transmitting or arbitrating at any given time. So each output is independent in that sense. Um, and each one keeps its own priority for least recently granted. So for a particular output, the priority is least recently granted. Um, in this particular spot, there's a, each cross point has a sense amplifier that's going to sense one of the output bits, and that's going to indicate whether or not it's been granted uh, the particular output channel. And then the, the next piece to, to note is that each of those priority vectors is connected to a wire, and it's going to use an inhibit-based approach. The idea here is if I'm requesting that line and I have priority, so if I had a one in that, in that square, then I pull down that line so that whoever's sensing that particular line uh, is not granted the system. And so um, finally, at the very end, we'll go back and update the priorities. So I'm going to walk through a little bit of an example of how least recently granted is performed. The first thing to note is that each of the requests is looking at a different bit of the output bus. So you can see request L is looking at this pri priority line L, the one on the farthest left. Request M is looking at the middle line, so it's sense amplifier sensing the middle output bit, and then request N is sensing the last output bit in the system. And so the way I achieve, uh, uh, so the lowest priority is at request L, again, because it has two zeros. It has no priority over either of the other two inputs. Request M is intermediate. It has priority over whoever's sensing priority line L. That's where the one is stored. And it has no priority over uh, N, where the zero is stored. And then my final request has the highest priority. It discharges both lines of the, the other two that are sensing it. And so if I, I do an example arbitration where request L and request M are both requesting this particular output bus, and request N is not requesting it. So request L and request M uh, move their request lines high. So I've indicated that red in this particular diagram. When they move that red, the, the bits in the priority vector, those squares, any place that the square is a one, the line is discharged. So in this case, priority line L is discharged and it turns black. The other two priority lines stay high, so they stay green. So then uh, the next step is that each of the sense amplifiers senses those bit lines. In this case, request L senses the first bit line, which had been discharged, doors a zero. Request M senses its line, since nobody had inhibited it, so nobody discharged its line, so nobody with higher priority was requesting, it's granted that particular output. And so then that's passed back to the input. It switches to its uh, data transmission mode and transmits data. 
Once it's finished with transmitting the data, it asserts a release signal. So in this case, it's release M, which comes in, and it's going to update the priority vectors. So we need to indicate uh, where the least recently granted priority has changed. And so the way this is done is first, this particular output is the most recently granted. So we reset the bits in its bit vector, saying that it has lowest priority over anybody. So nobody, it has no priority over anybody else. The next step is that we set all the bits along its column that it's sensing. In this way, we uh, guarantee that anybody who had lower priority than it, who had a zero there before, now has a one in that location and inhibits it. And anybody who already had a one, already had priority, and it stays where it's at. And so when we update those states, it looks like this. The lowest priority now becomes request L, request, or request M. The intermediate priority moves to request L, and request N stays at the highest priority. It's the least recently granted. If you look at that in kind of a, a diagram, um, request M is the one that we just released. It's moving to lowest priority. So if we look on the left side, it's in the middle. And then as we go and update the channel, M moves to the least priority. Everything that was lower than it upgrades by one priority. And anybody who had priority over it stays the same. So therefore, it, it stays at the same priority. So we took this swizzle switch design. We uh, fabricated, taped it out, and I'm going to present kind of the prototype results that we have here. So this is for a, a 64 by 64 bus system, with each bus being 128 bits big. Um, the blue box represents one cross point, so the priority bit vectors and the connection that's going on there. And we take those blue boxes. We've generated an SRAM style kind of compile, uh, compilation technique that lays it out, sets the right bits to connect in the right spot. We create a, a 16 by 16 macro. Then we place bit line and word line repeaters within the system to help with performance. We replicate that out till we get to 64 by 64 uh, input buses, each at 128 bits. Uh, the total chip that we use to test the systems here on the, the left, you can see the swizzle switch network, the SSN is the large portion in the middle. We've placed traffic generators at the inputs on the left and right, and then we test the input vectors coming out correctly with a signature analyzer at the output. Um, the fabric area, so just the swizzle switch itself, is about four millimeters squared. This was in a 45 nanometer process. Uh, it operates around 600 megahertz in terms of performance and gives a uh, energy efficiency of about 3.5 terabits per second per watt, so in terms of, of throughput. And so I have some plots with the actual data that we measured on the chip. Um, this is a plot. Given the supply voltage, what frequency or throughput does the system achieve? And so when we run it at, up, up at full voltage, we get 559 uh, megahertz, and that gets us about 4.47 terabits per second. If you're more concerned with energy efficiency, you can scale the system down so that the, the crossbar is operating slower. Uh, when we're running at about 0.55 uh, volts, we get 28 megahertz in terms of performance, so it's much slower, but it's only running at uh, 550 millivolts, or it's running, that still gets you 22 terabits per second. In a second, I'll show you the power numbers. So in terms of power, when we're at the full voltage, our crossbar consumes about 1.3 watts. And that ends up with an efficiency of 3.4 terabits per second per watt. When we scale it down to the low voltage, we can get it down to 110 milliwatts for the connection, uh, which gets us that um, an efficiency of 7.4 terabits per second per watt. And so that was the system that we um, taped out and tested. It's a really a series of three chips that kind of built into that uh, final chip that we designed. Um, and then we went on and we wanted to evaluate, well, what does this mean in terms of a, a system design? So we have this crossbar. We can scale it out to 64 by 64. What can we do architecturally with that? So we went ahead and did some uh, evaluation of some of those systems. And so one of the motivating factors, just kind of looking at it, is um, most existing interconnects, buses, crossbars, and rings start to run out of uh, scalability around 16 cores. And we're trying to improve that. So what people in uh, academia have been looking at for a long time now is this network on chip uh, idea that you have an on chip, a packet switched multi hop network where you have a grid of routers interconnected and you have to take these multiple hops through and, and they've looked at different configurations from simple meshes to toruses to flattened butterflies and clauses and uh, really elaborate interconnection techniques. Um, these all come with a disadvantage that they're multi hop, they take multiple cycles, and so we can give a, a flat crossbar, how well does it perform? And so uh, our proposal is to use a flat crossbar as far as we can take it, 
and create a single stage, one hop, kind of crossbar plus plus interconnect. And so just as a little bit of background, what we're gonna compare against as a baseline is a, a mesh network on chip. The idea here, what we simulated is an ARM Cortex A5. So this, this kind of tile in the middle shows the, the tile that gets replicated. It consists of an ARM Cortex A5, two pieces, an iCache, a dcache, and a portion of the L2 cache, and then it consists of a router. Uh, one interesting point to think about the router is itself has a crossbar, which you can see in the bottom right. So for a mesh on, uh, network on chip, it's usually a five by five crossbar, so it's relatively small, and so the advantages of using the techniques we talk about in Swizzle Switch are limited. When we look at Flattened Butterfly, it has a much higher rate of switch, and so there is some benefit from using the Swizzle Switch there. We take that tile, we replicate it across the chip, interconnect it north, south, east, west to, to communicate, and if one core tile wants to talk to another, it takes multiple hops through this grid of routers to find its destination. Uh, we also compare against the flattened butterfly. In the flattened butterfly case, we're actually going to apply our swizzle switch technique inside the crossbar so that we can get it uh, to run a little bit faster. Uh, the, we look at a 4 3 fly, which looks like we share, in this particular picture, four core tiles are sharing one router, and that router is also connected to all of the routers horizontally and vertically in its column and row. Okay. The, <clears throat> the nice thing about swizzle switches is it provides us with somewhat uniform access latency. And what that, what that means is every request sees the same distance to go to any particular piece of memory through this crossbar, which makes it a little easier to program and organize your data within the system. So you're not worried about this particular core is sharing data with that particular core, so I need to co-locate them close together. Everything is equidistant, so it takes some ease off of where you're placing threads, how data migration is managed. Uh, we've shown that it can help with power if we're, we're trying to scale down power, and I'll show you some results of where that helps. And it's, it's simpler to design. If it's a flat system, you're not worried about congestion management, flow control, um, you know, wormhole routing, and some of the advanced techniques that NOCs rely on to really get some of that performance back. And so um, we did a couple of quick background studies with just some synthetic traffic. I'll show you workload traffic in a minute of how well the mesh performs against Swizzle Switch. And so the mesh is on the left and swizzle switch is on the right. And this is a plot of the packet injection rate uh, for a hotspot type traffic. And for this, what we're doing is sending all of the traffic from every node to one corner of the system. So that corner is at 8.8. Eight, eight, so that's the top right corner where the thing is dark blue. And what you see with a mesh is that nodes that are close by get a lot of bandwidth. They're able to inject their things quickly, get it to its destination, and then inject something else whereas the nodes that are further away run into the congestion of everybody else in the system. If you have a swizzle switch where everything's flat and uniform latency and you're applying least recently granted to that particular uh, output, you end up with a flat distribution. And so the, the key here is that we're, if you take the best injection rate versus the worst injection rate and take a division and call that a, a metric of fairness, the SSN is 40 times more fair in terms of hotspot traffic. Now, not everything is hotspot traffic. Uh, we looked at uniform random traffic as well. And so in this particular one, um, every node is randomly selecting a different node to send to. The swizzle switch remains constant across everybody, uh, whereas you get some uh, higher throughput at the nodes near the center and the ones near the memory controllers on the mesh system. And in this particular case, we see about an 87% improvement in fairness. Um, so what does the swizzle switch interconnect look like for a 64-core system? In order to properly evaluate this, we had to go through a, a process of doing some floor planning, taking into consideration all the routing congestion and the wiring. And so this is the final floor plan we, we came up with. We pulled the L2s out of the core tiles and placed them around the edge of the system, so they're the dark blue rectangles located around the edge. And our core tiles consist of the same core and the same cache. Now the die size is a little bit bigger because the swizzle switch in the center takes up a little bit more area than the, the routers did in the NOC. It moved up by about 7% in terms of area. Uh, we did the floor planning to calculate the wire links, to, uh, did repeater placement only in between spots where there was a, uh, a gap between cores. We calculated out how fast we could get this thing to go um, and we scaled it down to 32 nanometers, redid some analysis on the, on the swizzle switch, improving some of our bit line repeaters. And so in, in the end, the, the two systems we end up evaluating, um, the NOC, so the, the mesh and the flattened butterfly that we'll look at, have a three gigahertz interconnect, and we're able to get our swizzle switch network up to 1.5 gigahertz. So it's running at half the frequency, but everything is a, a uniform latency away. 
And uh, we're running with our cores at a 1.5 gigahertz core, and there's 64 of them in the system. And so we ran this on the Splash 2 benchmark suite to kind of look at how performance uh, fit there. And so I have a quick summary of some of the results. And so this is a, a performance graph. Each of the, the bars represent one of the, the benchmarks in the Splash 2 benchmark suite, and I've normalized execution time to the, the mesh uh, in each case. And you can see the, the three bars go mesh, flatten butterfly, and then the swizzle switch. And you can see we reduce the execution time with each step. And uh, in particular, we break down where the, the time is spent between synchronization time, so stuff dealing with locks, which is the green portion, uh, core time, which actually doing work, which is the, the red piece, that part we can't reduce with the interconnect, and then memory stall time, where we're stalled for L1 misses in the system. And so you see the benchmarks, uh, Ocean and I think Radix here, have high uh, memory stalls. So they're waiting a lot of times on L1 accesses. And so we were able to reduce that time uh, by using a better interconnect. Some of the cases don't have memory stall times but have synchronization stalls. So they spend a lot of time passing locks back and forth or waiting for a lock to be acquired through the memory system and coherence uh, mechanisms. And uh, in those cases, we reduce the green portion of the graph. And so in, in terms of fairness, we wanted to look at how these L1 latencies kind of played out and where everything was. So we went and created a histogram, which is not showing up with the proper font. But uh, we created a histogram. I'll tell you what it says. The, the bottom is quality of service measured in CPU cycles for L1 accesses. And then on the left side is a, basically a, a distribution, so a percentage of requests that took that amount of time. The blue bar, uh, the blue bar is going across as kind of the distribution for um, the mesh interconnect. And you can see that its average latency, you can't see the number, but it's about 50 CPU cycles and has a very wide spread. So it's not very uniform in terms of its access latency. So the standard deviation of the variance is very wide. When you move to the, the flattened butterfly, which is the red, we provided more interconnection stages, so it's shorter, a shorter number of hops to get to any particular location. We kind of condense that down and move the distribution to the left. And when you go to the SSN, we make it you know, on, the, on the left very tight to the top. Uh, the second set of bars way over on the right are the accesses going out to main memory. So they're taking uh, 100, 110 CPU cycles. But you'll see that the distribution that's spread out over the, the mesh pushes the mesh accesses way out to the right, whereas most of the SSN accesses are closer. Um, the other thing to note is that the SSN isn't exactly uniform access latency. There is some contention within the system itself. Uh, there is coherence messages that need to be passed around. So there is a small distribution around that. But the variance is quite small. Um, if we look at power of the system, and I'll go over this quickly, the, you can see that uh, on average on the far right, the SSN runs at about, oh, let's see if we can find the number here. I think it's one watt in terms of power for these particular benchmarks on average. And so this is just the interconnect power. And I've broken it down by pieces. You can look at it further. If you break it down to total energy for the benchmark, uh, the, the interesting piece there is that by speeding up the interconnect, we get the job done sooner, so we save also on core time as well. And so we save about 11% in terms of uh, average energy reduction across the benchmark suite. And so just to kind of summarize my talk today, we, we first started talking about the Swizzle Switch prototype, the chip we fabricated, which was a 64 by 64 crossbar with 128-bit buses. It had least recently granted priority embedded within the network, and it achieved 4.4 terabits per second at about 600 megahertz, and it consumed about 1.3 watts of power. Um, the, the second half of my talk, we kind of evaluated that in terms of an NOC-based system, and we looked at it as a flat crossbar system, not claiming that this is going to scale well beyond that, but it's at least a good building block for building NOC systems with large radix crossbars within them. Uh, by using the swizzle switch, we improved performance by 21%. We reduced the power by 28%, and we reduced that latency variability in that graph we couldn't quite read by 3x. So that's my talk. We have plenty of time for questions. Uh, please use the microphone, state your name and your affiliation. We'll start on the right. Okay. Hi, Tadao Nakamura, Cool Chips Conference Series. Uh, your switch still uses uh, uh, Islam, Islam like. So, uh, you probably you use uh, pre charge. Yes, we have to dynamically pre charge the. the oh, wires. but the. Uh, 
if you use B charge, the, sta the step could have some time. So, so, so uh, because the procedure, procedure mm -hmm. of using a B charge, it's not always good, I think. But uh, fortunately, your combination could be probably main memory, uh, no, no, memory and switch. So matching could be probably okay. But uh, if you uh, make a speed up on memory, in this case, you want to switch. If you use uh, pre-charge, the stage of pre-charge takes some time. Could you understand? Yeah, so, th so there is a, a set of time that we have to take to pre-charge the wires. Yeah. And then it needs to be discharged or conditionally discharged based on some condition. Yeah. And then there's a sense amplifier that, that reads that out. Okay. And so we have all that time accumulated with inside the, the system. And so our, our maximum delay is from a request coming in, doing the discharge, and then sending the response back out. And that's how we determine our maximum delay in the system. Yes, OK. Much, yeah. much appreciated. Yeah. Take the left side. Hi, uh, Greg Roll, Intel Corporation. Um, with your floor plan diagram, you showed the increasing latency as you add additional tiles. Uh, at what point, could you speculate at what point this technique begins to uh, become less effective in terms of core count, and it would make sense to go back to a, a one latency cycle per hop type mechanism. Right, so um, it all depends on the size of the tile you end up making. If you make your caches bigger, the tiles get bigger, and the links that go over the top change. In terms of the crossbar itself, uh, we've done the scaling it out, and somewhere between 64 and 128 is where the crossbar itself stops scaling in terms of performance. And so. We can push ours, 64 we can get, 128 is a small win over 64. So my guess is 64 is about the top that we would push it, but uh, from there you could build an NOC-based system with Radix 64 routers that interconnected stuff together. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name's Craig Wittenbrink from NVIDIA, and I had a quick question on the second part of your talk, which you did with the simulation. So you're evaluating a fully connected crossbar versus a mesh network, which I guess is the flattened butterfly. Um, the other aspect of the efficiency would be the implementation or the area overhead. So did you evaluate how much, you know, what would the size of the chip be with the, um, the mesh network versus what you would have with the fully connected crossbar? Yeah, so um, the area overhead from using the crossbar in the middle for the fully connected was about 7% was a, the area overhead we ended up with. And we think we can trim that down a little bit. There's some wasted white space around our swizzle switch, but we did that just to avoid wiring congestion in the center. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Zhen Li from Samsung. So I have a question. So uh, for the second part of the talk, so when you evaluate the system, do you put swizzle switch between the memory and L2 or between L2 and L1? In this particular case, it was between the L2 and L1. Okay, I see. Uh, another question is, like when you do this uh, evaluation against mesh, um, uh, because mesh is a distributed system, so which means you can turn off parts of the routers if some of the cores are not fully used. But for swizzle switch, can you do the similar thing? Like you can power down or like using lower voltage for some of the like input and outputs? So if you wanted to turn off a, a portion of the chip, like a quadrant, uh, that's difficult to do with the swizzle switch, whereas with an NOC, you could uh, disable like a quadrant of the chip. But the, the power consumption um, is on the low side, but you, know, you couldn't uh, just power gate off parts of it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, our second talk is uh, FPGA Augmented ASICs. The time has come. The speaker is David Riddick, and he's the chief architect at SolarFlare, which he co-founded in 2002. And before SolarFlare, he worked with the other founders at AT&T Laboratories Cambridge on a proprietary high-performance network research project. At SolarFlare, David's goal is to make it easy for applications to get the very highest possible level of performance using standard Ethernet networks and programming interfaces. And David holds a PhD in high performance networking from the University of Cambridge. David? Thanks, Bob. Good morning. Um, 
So this is possibly the wrong, uh, the wrong audience to say this to, but uh, nobody uses hardware for acceleration, by which I really mean the vast majority of end users are not using hardware for acceleration. They're not doing custom business logic in hardware in, at any scale. So what I'd like to talk about today is the reason that people are not able to do that more. So in other words, why it's so hard and why it's not cost effective for them. What we're trying to do to make it a little bit easier, and um, I'm going to be talking about online, online trading applications as my example domain for that. And it's very much a sort of practical, non-research approach because we're, we're really making stuff here that people are deploying. OK, so like I said, online trading. So these guys are in a latency race. Um, they are receiving inputs in the form of market information. They're running some algorithm. And then they're taking an action, which might be uh, submitting an order to purchase stocks and shares. Whoever does that fastest makes more money. Um, as a result, they've got a direct incentive to go faster. And there's no question whatsoever that for these guys, hardware can make them go faster. And indeed, some of them are using FPGA technology today. It's just it's a tiny, tiny minority. And when I go and see these guys, they constantly say to me, we've, we've either thought about it and ruled it out, or we've got a tiny group that's doing it, but we've never got it into production, or, or whatever. They've all got great ideas about what they want to do, but they can't actually get it into production. And this is really about the fact that it's not performance at any cost. They've got to balance the inconvenience of going through that route against um, the benefit, so the, the flexibility, speed of deployment. Um, some of these guys are changing their algorithms on a daily basis in order to try and outfox the competition. The available skills. They've all got big teams of engineers, but the number of hardware engineers is tiny by comparison. Most of the guys are software. Uh, cost, of course, uh, and I'm talking here not just about the, the adapters, you know, the physical devices that you put in the servers, but also about uh, the cost of development and, uh, and verification, QA, risk, all of that stuff. And of course, finally, compatibility. So very, very quickly, here's an introduction to how trading systems work. Um, the obvious one is the traders. Uh, they're receiving information from the exchanges. That's the uh, the trading venue on the right-hand side. So that might be a stock exchange, or it might be an internal trading venue. Um, he's publishing market information or market data using UDP multicast. That's consumed by the traders. Using that to make their decisions, they then submit orders either through a broker or directly into the market using a TCP connection. And they're looking to get the lowest possible latency both for transmit and receive. The brokers also have a latency incentive, which is to say the lowest latency broker will tend to get more business. And the trading venues, the uh, exchanges, are also competing with each other to attract trades to their venues. The lower latency venues get more business. OK, so they've got a direct incentive. They're going to make money if they get acceleration. So they're already spending money on clever technologies. And one of the bits and pieces that's in the critical path is the network adapter. And that's what SolarFlare sells to these guys today. Um, now, the, I'll just talk a little bit about the features of the adapters we sell today, because those features are then used by the hardware acceleration that I want to talk about later on in the talk. So uh, first of all, of course, it's a very low latency cut through design. We want to get packets off the wire and into host memory as quickly as possible, and vice versa. But the really interesting feature that uh, makes this adapter go faster than most of the others is this VNIC architecture. So most modern network adapters are multi-queue capable. And that means they've got multiple separate channels that software can use to send and receive packets. This is great because it allows you to spread load over multiple software contexts, multiple CPU cores. Um, and uh, uh, the, the, the real difference is with our adapter, we've got a huge number of them. So you can afford to dedicate one of these per thread or per application. And, and secondly, you can use this for a technique called kernel bypass. 
Now, traditionally, packets arrive at the adapter, and they're delivered into buffers that the OS kernel can, t can see. The protocol stack executes in the kernel in response to an interrupt firing, and then packets containing data are delivered to sockets. Applications read and write data from sockets using the system call interface. A technique called kernel bypass allows applications to talk directly to the hardware. So obviously, you have to have special hardware to do this. It has to export interfaces that are protected so you don't lose the system integrity. You also have to have multiple channels so that each app can talk to the hardware independently of each other. Um, and the really big advantage is that you're saving CPU overhead. Now, you've probably heard of technologies like InfiniBand and, and earlier technologies like Mirinet that came before it. Those have been widely used in HPC for, for donkey's years. And generally speaking, they've introduced new, new APIs, um, in some cases, new physical layers uh, to make the networking go faster. The thing that's really different about our open onload technology is that we're doing this using regular Ethernet, standard TCP and UDP protocols, and the standard BSD sockets API. So that means that people can deploy this without really changing their network model at all. Existing applications don't have to be changed. All they've got to do is plug in our adapter, use our drivers, and their existing applications go faster. So that's really key because it makes it cheap and easy to deploy. And that's really the problem with hardware acceleration. So what is the problem that these guys encounter? Well, you know, they've got some business problem that they want to solve. Um, and so they're, gonna, they're, they're not going to make their own hardware. So they've got to buy an adapter off the shelf. And there are a number of adapters out there you can buy that have an FPGA on and, and 10 gig max. Um, so you've got to evaluate those, choose which one you like. They're fairly expensive. The reason they're expensive is because they're low volume. And the reason they have low volume is because they're expensive. So we need to break out of that cycle. Um, OK, now you've got to create a, a bit file to go onto your FPGA. So you'll need some development tools. You'll need IP blocks, including PCI, the, the Macs, uh, all that sort of stuff, memory controllers, possibly. You'll need a bunch of logic that I would call boilerplate, meaning everybody who's going to do this wants the same bits of logic including packet handling, passing, demultiplexing, buffering, protocol handling, managing links. These guys really want this stuff to be um, to integrate nicely into their monitoring system. So you need monitoring of the links, statistics, error counting, all that sort of stuff. Everybody's going to need those things. You're also going to need device drivers. Uh, you're going to need a way of configuring it. And you're going to need a fast way of talking to your application which means you're probably going to have to re-implement kernel bypass yourself. And notice we haven't even begun to talk about business logic yet. Not a single line of it. So what's wrong with that? Um, far too much work. How can we fix that? Well, we could provide all of the common bits for a start off. Secondly, we need a simpler host interface. The problem with just creating a bit file and slapping it on an FPGA is that that bit file defines the interface between the software and the hardware, which means it's different every single time you do it. And that means you need new drivers every time. And that's enormously expensive. Secondly, this is hard to deploy incrementally. You've got a brand new device interacting in software in a new way. You're almost going to have to riff everything out and start from scratch. Secondly, you've got problems like the chances are your custom device will only accelerate a small subset of the traffic that you're interested in, just the critical path. But you've still got all this other stuff to handle. So you'll probably have to have this device in addition to a regular network adapter, which means an extra PCIe slot, extra cabling, extra switches, changing your network topology. You can see that's a little bit painful. And finally, it's expensive, mainly just because of the development effort. So we need something that is easier to develop, and we need um, to provide lots of bits that can be reused. And we also need to provide off-the-shelf applications that lots of these people can use without changing them, because many of them are just never going to have FPGA developers in-house at all. So this is what we're uh, selling. Um, this is our attempted solution to these problems. So at the top, you have the regular FPGA cards that you can buy today. 
FPGA is directly attached to the PCIe bus of the host and has some integrated 10 gig max. I would call that a host attached FPGA with 10 gig Mac. The difference what we're doing is I'd call it a fully featured network adapter that happens to have FPGA acceleration added onto it. So the difference is, to the host, it looks like a network adapter. And that's because the NIC ASIC, that box there, that's exactly say, the same as the ASIC that we have in our adapters today. And that's what the host sees. As a result, it works out of the box as a network adapter. The drivers that we have today work with this new card. You don't have to change anything. That supports incremental upgrade, because you can plug this thing into your service today without changing anything, and it just works. And then you can enable clever bits of acceleration incrementally over time. Also, you don't have to have that extra PCIe slot. To address the problem of people not having um, their own FPGA developers, we're going to be producing our own applications. And I'll give you a couple of examples of those in a minute. Uh, those sol solve common problems that people in the industry uh, have told us that they want solutions to. Um, in some cases, a bit of application integration is needed. In some cases, not. And the other thing is, this is an open platform. So we've got partners who are developing their own applications for this, and we absolutely want to welcome as many other people as are interested to develop applications for this platform um, and then sell them on to, uh, to the end users. So to support that and to support end users doing their own development, we're also providing a developer kit that provides the reusable blocks. So here's a, a block diagram, quick overview of what's on the adapter. This is the, the network controller chip, the one that's on our existing cards, Stratix 5 FPGA. They talk to each other through just a regular 10 gig Ethernet link, two of them. So the interface between the controller and the, and the FPGA is just packets. And then the FPGA talks to the outside world using two 10 gig interfaces with SFP cages. So here's the PCIe connection into the host. Um, we've got uh, DDR3 DIMMs, so optional memory for people who want to have more memory than the FPGA can provide. We've got a number of flash chips to provide the, the um, FPGA images and, and firmware and anything else that people want to put on there. Micro SD socket in case you want persistent storage. Uh, various power control stuff. And another interesting feature is this stable oscillator. The uh, trading guys are fanatically interested in time. And this allows us to provide them with synchronized time on the FPGA, uh, synchronized using the, the Precision Time Protocol, PCP. And that means that the FPGA can timestamp events internally, and those timestamps are synchronized across their entire data center. So I think I've already briefly covered this, but the point is that the host interface is a network adapter. The host sees a network adapter. The FPGA is really just a bump in the wire. And so the, the interface between applications and the FPGA is just packets. Therefore, the application talks to the FPGA through the sockets interface. And if it wants to go fast, it can use kernel bypass. We also provide a register bus, which can be mastered via software. Um, and that is a bus that our applications can expose their own registers through. And, and that's not really a high performance bus, so that's just about configuration. There's also a notification mechanism for alerting software of out of band events. OK, so uh, what are the negatives of this approach? Well, first of all, com so I'm comparing now our uh, approach in the top right with the, the traditional host attached FPGA at the bottom there. So our approach, which is called AOE, Application Onload Engine, it does have slightly higher latency between the FPGA and the host because we've got to go through our controller chip. And secondly, there's no direct access to the host from the FPGA, which means that FPGA apps themselves can't master the bus, and they can't directly read and write host memory. Also, I mean, in the same way, the FPGA can't master other devices. So those are the trade-offs. What could we have done differently? I mean, the first constraint that we had to live with is we didn't want to change our ASIC chip at this time. So these, the only architectures available to us are ones that don't involve changing that chip. So what we could have done instead is made the FPGA, PC, sorry, made the FPGA PCIe attached and communicate with the NIC ASIC over the PCIe bus. That gives you the fast access to the host from the FPGA, 
the problem is it's enormously complex by comparison because the FPGA now has to master the NIC using the, the interface that was designed for software. And that's not a fun thing to do in hardware. Secondly, you need a PCIe core in the FPGA, which uses up some space. And the real killer is that the fast path for your accelerated traffic is significantly higher, because you've got to go through this, uh, this convoluted path from the NIC ASIC through the FPGA and back into the host. Alternatively, we could have done it this way round, which is to say, roughly what we've got, but add an extra PCIe interface to the FPGA. I mean, that's fine. The only downsides are a whole bunch of extra complexity in the FPGA with that PCIe uh, controller there. And secondly, you've got to have this switch chip, which is going to add latency. Finally, what might we do to the ASIC to improve the situation slightly? And the answer is just add an extra little fast bus between the FPGA and the ASIC here. That would give us the direct access to, to host memory with very high performance without any of the downsides. But quite frankly, so far, I've not seen any applications that really need that direct host access. Um, so I'm not sure it's justified. We'll wait and see. OK, so here's uh, a couple of examples of applications just to get an idea of, of why this makes it easier to integrate. So one of the problems these folks have is, is receiving market data. So this is the information published by the exchanges about trades. On the bigger exchanges, it's an absolute flood. And to compound that problem, it's published in two copies called A and B. And it's done for, that's done for redundancy, so that if there's any hardware failures, you'll still get one copy. Now, you, you do want both of those copies, because otherwise you're not redundant. Uh, and secondly, you don't know which one's going to have the lower latency. So you need to take both of them and do arbitration. And currently, of course, that's done in software. So the obvious trick is move the arbitration into the FPGA. You get all the benefits, but you halve the data rate going into the server. The reason that helps is that these guys don't always keep up. And whenever they don't keep up, they get queuing delays. Um, so hopefully, this technology reduces the rate enough that they don't get queuing delays anymore. And secondly, if they really don't keep up, their buffers fill and they get drops, and that's catastrophic. The thing that's beautiful about this application is this acceleration is completely transparent to the software. You don't have to change the software at all to get this. So it's really, really easy to deploy. Second example, symbol splitting. So market data packets will each contain multiple messages. Each message will relate to a particular symbol. And a symbol is a security, such as uh, a stock in a company. Um, now, uh, the, the problem is that they want to distribute the load of processing these messages over multiple cores, because the rate's just so high. And what they have to do is they have to process all messages for a given security in the correct order. So they can't just randomly fire packets at random cores and hope for the best. They have to process them all in order in a single thread, split out the different symbols to different threads, and then have other threads handling that. Now, that's horribly inefficient. Uh, it's horribly inefficient in terms of cache access. It's expensive in terms of the synchronization between the cores, and you get latency just from the extra thread hops. So that's horrible. So what we want to do is we want to put the symbol splitting into the FPGA. Um, the night. Um, and then what we're doing really is we're giving each set of symbols a new stream. Each stream will get a new multicast group and port number. And then the NIC ASIC can distribute those streams over different VNICs. And each VNIC can be handled by a different thread or a different application. This also gives you a way of throwing particular symbols that you're not interested in on the floor so that you don't have to deal with them at all. So that's the win. It's really about scaling efficiently over multiple cores or throwing away stuff you're not interested in. So I'll talk a little bit now about the, the developer kit and the component library that we're providing. And I'm going to use this as an example to show how the symbol splitter is implemented, uh, at least a simplified version thereof. So the idea is reusable components. And obviously, if you want to compose stuff, you have to have a fairly standard interface between your components. And so we have a, we've defined a streaming bus based on Altera's Avalon um, that carries packets between components. And the important thing is that there are metadata words interleaved within the packets that carry information between components. So components can munge the data in the packets. They can add and remove metadata. Um, and they can take actions based on what's in the metadata. 
So here's the symbol splitter. Packets arrive off the wire. Uh, bear in mind this is all cut through, so you don't know the length at this point. And you just have one metadata word at the beginning, giving a little bit of information about where the packets come from. Next thing that happens is you do a bit of passing of headers, find out where the headers are. That's metadata. Extract the fields that you're going to use to identify the streams that you're interested in. Then you're going to do a lookup. Is this a stream that I want to do something special to? So you're going to get two bits of extra metadata in this case, an action, what shall I do with this packet, and a stream ID. Next stage is message passing. So this is a bit of logic that really understands the market data format that we're using in this particular case. Um, so this is a, a bit less general, but it's still going to be usable for lots of different applications uh, in these trading applications. And it's going to pass out the individual messages within the packet and identify the particular symbol or security that that message relates to. And, and next, we're going to say, for packets that we're not interested in, let's just chuck them straight through to the host. The point being, we want this to work like a regular NIC for any traffic that we're not accelerating. Next, we've got the message splitter. That's going to take those um, metadata words that identify the message boundaries and use them to split the one packet into multiple per message packets. This guy doesn't need to know anything about the market data format. He just looks for the metadata words to tell him what to do. Then we do another lookup. This is going to convert the symbol or security into an integer ID so that we can chuck it into one of the end streams that we're going to support. That's the demultiplexer. Demultiplexer doesn't know anything about symbols or market data. He just knows that I take the integer ID from a particular place in the metadata and use that to choose which output to take. Then we've got a, a bit of uh, an arbiter to decide who goes next. This is obviously pretty application specific. So our demultiplexer block has a, a nice API where you can put a custom arbiter in there. And it's got to do some clever stuff to make sure that we don't increase latency um, when we're trying to coalesce messages into packets. And then we've got the message stitcher, which combines messages into larger packets, and then they stream through into the host. OK. So this slide is, is we're very nearly at the end. And what we're doing here is we're trying to say, how much work do you have to do if you want to do your own custom logic? So you've bought our adapter, you've got the developer kit, and you want to put a bit of business logic in there. So this is what you have to do if you use a regular host attached PC, um, PCIe attached FPGA card. You have to do the complete FPGA image, admittedly using some standard off-the-shelf blocks, but you're responsible for most of the work there. Because the host interface is new, you've got to write new device drivers. You've got to come up with a way for applications to talk to this thing with very high performance, which means you've got to do your own kernel bypass. And then, of course, you've got to do a little bit of app integration. This is what you have to do with our solution. A little bit of business logic in the FPGA, composing those uh, standard blocks together with your own logic, and a bit of app integration. Everything else is done for you. So hopefully you can see that's going to be an awfully lot less work. So that's it. Um, this thing is uh, not quite generally available, but it's already been uh, put into the hands of a select number of early customers. It's going into production in real trading systems in about a month or two's time. GA very, very soon. So give me a shout if you've got any questions. Thank you. Bob Felderman from Google. Uh, so um, I'm not sure I got it from your last slide there. Um, you're basically just recreating raw Ethernet packets. There's no metadata that comes into your chip because you never modified your chip, right? That's, well, that's right. Um, I mean, the interface between the FPGA and the NIC controller is always Ethernet packets. They don't have to be exactly the same format as what came in from the wire, of course. If you want to carry metadata, you just need to change your encapsulation in some way. The, the slight constraint that you need to think about when you do that, though, is that you ideally want to choose an encapsulation that the NIC controller will be able to understand in order to be able to do the flow steering, in order to be able to direct flows to particular applications. And there are some restrictions there as to what sort of 
um, what sort of headers it can use to make that determination. You may uh, just create new, completely new UDP streams or UDP ports or something like that to give you your demultiplex. That's right. So in, in the symbol splitting example, all of the data is coming in on a single stream and you're sending it out on multiple streams and the NIC, in the NIC controller chip is using the multiple stream headers to direct those flows to different application threads without having to do the demultiplex in software. Other questions? Is that all right? All right, thank you, speaker. Thank you. Uh, the final talk is on the SwitchX architecture by Diego Krupnikov. And Diego is the Senior Director of Architecture at Mellanox Technologies, where he's been since 1999 driving chip and system architectures for five generations of Mellanox products. He's been a key member of the InfiniBand Trade Association since its beginning. He's been a founding director of the Open Fabrics Alliance and now chairs its Technology Advisory Council. He's also a member of the IEEE 802.1 group, defining the next generation of Ethernet, and the T11 committee that's in charge of the fiber channel specification. So if it attaches to a network, you need to talk to this guy. Um, he, uh, he's an inventor on multiple patents in the areas of uh, computer networks and system architectures, holds a BSc in computer engineering and an MSc in EE, both from the Technion Israel Institute of Technology. Good morning, everyone. Um, happy to be here and talk about SwitchX, our virtual protocol interconnect uh, architecture. Um, SwitchX is uh, part of uh, an end-to-end -end solution that uh, Mellanox uh, provides. And uh, SwitchX is a central component to that architecture in that it's uh, the switching piece of the business that uh, attaches and now it's together. And uh, when we call this uh, virtual protocol interconnect, what we mean is that uh, um, at the core of this technology, there are devices that not, do not really care too much about what's the format of the packets on the wire. Uh, these uh, devices can operate uh, in uh, whatever uh, form of uh, link layer or phi technology uh, you want, uh, be it InfiniBand, which is at the core of our business, uh, and also Ethernet or uh, fiber channel. SwitchX is our fifth generation uh, switching uh, integrating uh, circuit uh, that offers all the way from uh, one gigabit per second to a 56 gigabit per second uh, uh, interconnect. Uh, has an aggregated um, throughput of um, about four terabits per second. It offers uh, 36 ports of up to uh, 56 gigabit per second. Um, uh, 56 gigabit per second is what in InfiniBand is uh, called the, the, the FDR uh, rate. Uh, it's a hot chip, but in a way it's a very cool chip because uh, there's a lot of uh, effort and thought put into making it very low power. Uh, you'll see that um, we take uh, about 0 0.6 watt per 10 gigabit per second uh, port and roughly 1.5 watt per 40 gigabit uh, ethernet connection, which is um, a significant achievement. Uh, there are multiple uh, different ways uh, to uh, uh, build uh, systems based on this, ranging from 1U devices for top-of-the-rack applications to modular uh, switches, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, these are uh, some uh, publicly available results from this device. We, uh, we, we introduced this device roughly a year and a half ago. Um, Throughput is uh, measured on a single chip uh, running at full wire speed on these experiments. And as you can see at the, uh, the bottom of this slide, one of the uh, most impressive results is the lowest available late, uh, attainable latency, roughly 200 nanoseconds, uh, over a, a wide range of uh, different packet sizes and with virtually, uh, <coughs> virtually no jitter. 
At the physical layer, uh, the device supports, as I said, a very wide variety of uh, connectivity options uh, in InfiniBand fiber channel and Ethernet going all the way uh, from the very low, uh, low end uh, speeds uh, to uh, uh, 40 and 56 and uh, 100 uh, gigabits per second. Uh, it supports, of course, Ethernet with all the new advances recently introduced by IEEE. It supports uh, Trill, the uh, recently uh, introduced work uh, from IETF. Uh, support for congestion management, uh, fiber channel forwarding, IP and infinitum routing. Um, at the core of this device, there's, uh, of course, as you can expect from a switch, a layer two uh, uh, switching module that can take uh, and do the plain vanilla Ethernet switching. Uh, there's an IP routing function that can do layer three routing. There's a trail bridge. And there's also uh, the ability to do gatewaying into fiber channel to create converged networks using FCOE in multiple uh, different modes. Together with that, uh, we have the InfiniBand uh, functionality where there's uh, InfiniBand switching and everything uh, shown on this slide can operate at the same time. So there exists essentially a path for packets to go from InfiniBand networks to Ethernet networks or fiber channel networks all the way across the corresponding modules. Uh, and I'll get into a little bit more details when we go through the, the pipe of the, of the chip. The interesting thing about this um, concept is that uh, when you deploy a solution based on this device, you don't really need to commit a priori with a specific type of uh, physical interconnect. The solution is completely repurposable uh, on, the, um, on the spot. So you can start with, uh, with an Ethernet network because that's what maybe people feel more comfortable with uh, deploying. And then uh, via software upgrade, uh, you can turn your network into a more efficient uh, InfiniBand without any changes uh, to the hardware. One interesting concept that we've uh, introduced with the SwitchX product family is the ability to carve out of a single uh, switch device multiple partitions that can be individually managed. And in that way, uh, you can segment your uh, data and control planes within a single device uh, flexibly associating every single physical port with one of these partitions. And by doing that, you can create a, a multi-tenancy environment uh, for switching solutions where, uh, that goes well beyond the typical virtualization techniques because now you get a truly uh, independently manageable entity that is carved out of a, of a single uh, component. In addition to that, uh, SwitchX supports uh, a wide range of edge uh, bridge virtualization uh, that was also recently defined by uh, the IEEE that introduces uh, the ability to uh, create within a single physical port multiple virtual port instances that can then furthermore uh, multiplex and demultiplex at the virtual switch instantiations on the end nodes. There's the virtual edge bridges, there's the uh, uh, VEPA uh, basic and extended modes. Uh, SwitchX supports up to 16 virtual switch port instances per physical port. And uh, these, uh, these virtual switch port instances are not to be confused with virtual machines. Those uh, multiple thousands are supported. This would be multiple tenants or administrative domains within a, within a single end node. SwitchX uh, has a stacking protocol that allows you to build out of uh, multiple SwitchX components a single monolithic image of, uh, of, a, of a bigger switch. Uh, the topologies can be uh, arbitrary. They're chain and ring topologies. I'm going to uh, get um, in more detail about that in a subsequent slide. This allows for a single, management, single point of management across the entire uh, stacking complex. Um, one way to do stacking uh, 
that uh, has a lot of resonance in the high performance compute business and in some of the most modern data centers is to do that in a way that allows full bisectional bandwidth uh, between any two ports on the stacking complex. Uh, one way to do that is to use uh, fat tree topologies that are very common and prevalent in the high performance computing uh, space uh, within uh, this, uh, this stacking domain. With, uh, with switch X components, given the very uh, high port, uh, port count density, uh, you can build up to uh, uh, 1,700 uh, 10 gigabit uh, Ethernet ports on a full bisectional, uh, no oversubscription um, um, uh, topology with uh, just two layers of, uh, of switch X uh, devices. Uh, this would be, of course, a non-blocking topology. Uh, there are a couple uh, more examples shown here in the slide for reference. As far as management, uh, we have PCI-based or uh, network interface, gigabit Ethernet-based uh, management interfaces for single chip and multi-chip, uh, where you can do um, um, direct ask access management or inbound management, and uh, this comes uh, to play very nicely with um, a lot of these uh, new techniques uh, in the software-defined uh, networking space uh, that uh, are very uh, <coughs> um, are, are part of our uh, of our legacy in a way. Uh, within Mellanox, uh, given the, the way uh, networks are managed uh, in InfiniBand. If we zoom in a little bit on the way uh, SwitchX uh, works, uh, one of the key um, elements in this uh, very sophisticated and feature-rich design is that we kept uh, the, the internal pipe as a, a, in a way that strictly represents the modular description of the building blocks that I described in the functional representation of the device. So a packet comes in, goes through uh, the lowest uh, physical and uh, MAC layers, and gets into a packet uh, classification uh, stage where um, um, uh, the packet is essentially parsed. Uh, remember that this is a device that can uh, accept uh, a very wide range of different uh, packet formats. I was talking about the fact that through the same wire, you could be getting InfiniBand fiber channel Ethernet packets. So there's a very sophisticated parser that uh, decomposes the packet into uh, a more structural representation that the chip can um, further process. There's an ingress policy engine that uh, I'm, talk I'm going to talk about in a little bit more detail that does basically what is typically referred as ACLs. Um, and then uh, we go into the forwarding uh, stage where there's a layer two forwarding uh, engine followed by a layer three forwarding engine, subsequently followed by yet another layer two forwarding engine. And this is to represent the fact that when you're going through layer three forwarding, uh, in th with this device you can generically uh, go across the two independent layer two domains uh, through which you're uh, going across. Uh, when the packet is about to leave, there's another policy-based engine that can uh, make uh, further uh, sophisticated decisions based on the way the packet looks um, on its way out. And then there's the queuing and scheduling step uh, expected from, uh, from a switch where uh, the switch crossbar is going to be instructed on how to uh, uh, take the packets uh, to take the packets out. Here's an example of the packet flow for uh, three different uh, for three different scenarios representative of a, of a stacked environment when we have a multiple of these switch X components in a, in a stacking scenario. Uh, on the left hand side, uh, there's uh, the packet flow um, that uh, an, an ingress device uh, would would do on the on this stack uh, on the stacking environment. The packet comes in. The blue the blue portion of the packet is the actual payload, and the green one is the is the header information. 
So uh, the entire packet is placed on the data buffer, and then the header information goes through the uh, control plane. And at the end, when the, when the packet is about to leave, uh, some a command is given to the uh, forwarding log to the um, output logic to the to the queuing and scheduling, so that the stacking header is added to the packet and the packet comes out to the stacking header. In the middle, we have uh, the example of a straightforward uh, forwarding of a packet uh, that happens to be in this case in the middle of a stacking environment where the forwarding is done based on the gray header, which is the stacking header that happens to be an Ethernet header as well. And then there's the egress uh, device example where the, um, the forwarding is done based on the stacking information, but then before the packet comes out, the stacking header is stripped off of the packet and the packet is forwarded out as it was uh, coming in. Let's jump a little bit into the ACL implementation, implementation structure because uh, we have a little bit of uh, innovation here as well. And uh, one of the things uh, that are uh, very important, ACLs are a key component in a, in a switch these days, uh, also in the context of what uh, OpenFlow is uh, generating in the industry. And uh, ACLs are uh, not only in interesting, but also one of the most expensive components in a switch implementation, because it's typically based on uh, TCOMs, and TCOMs are expensive, take a lot of space. Um, so ideally, if I had infinite TCOM space, uh, the ACL structure would be very simple. I would just feed all my packet bits into the, the TCOM and have some uh, very sophisticated form of an action table that could, uh, in, a, in an amorphous way, uh, just uh, take the combination of input bits and map them into what is that I want to do uh, for that combination. Thing is, uh, as I was saying, that TCOMs are very expensive, so uh, one of the challenges is how to build your ACL logic so that with a given amount of TCOM space, you can uh, cover as uh, flexible as possible uh, logic and, 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 and sophisticated actions uh, for, your, uh, for your packets. And the way we've done that is by taking advantage of this sophisticated parsing logic that we uh, were talking about before, where uh, we take advantage of, the, of, of all this structured information that we know about the packet and are able to do a much smarter binding of a packet into the uh, TCOM rules that are going to apply to it, uh, not just uh, typical or common uh, switches in the past what used to do. They used to determine the, the set of rules that they were going to apply based on the port through which the packet came, uh, came in. That's called port binding or the VLAN on which the packet uh, came in. Uh, that's the most common case. What we're doing is we're significantly extending this into uh, creating much more sophisticated ways of classifying a packet. So at first we have this concept that is called the ACL group, and then based on a much more um, flexible way to determine the packet, you, we could take, for example, all the FCOE packets and associate them with an S ACL group. And what an ACL group is, is a sequence of rules that will be followed um, as a program in a way uh, uh, to analyze the packet. And each one of these rules, uh, each one of the rules in this sequence uh, will take an action. The, within the ACL group, there are, uh, as I said, a sequence of ACLs. And these ACLs can uh, also within themselves take advantage of the packet structure to determine different areas within that uh, TCOM space that represent the ACL rule that this given packet needs to be looking at. Uh, one of the things that this allows is to uh, uh, share space in the TCOM uh, for uh, rules that apply to packets of, uh, of different structure. And uh, in addition to this mechanism that just goes sequentially across uh, the ACL rules in a given ACL group, what we have implemented is a way to branch out of an ACL group by pointing to a different ACL rule given, on the, given the action that was selected based on the match for the previous rule. So what we can do is to uh, uh, do something equivalent to a function call where you jump into another type of ACL based on the result of your previous ACL. Or we could do uh, a branch where we just uh, leave the originally intended ACL group based on the, uh, on the selected uh, action. 
Going into uh, a little bit of the queuing and the scheduling, um, which is, uh, in a way, the bread and butter of, uh, of uh, packet switching. Uh, packets are, uh, the, the switch needs to decide uh, a certain order in which to um, um, send packets out. And uh, uh, of course, the interesting uh, scenarios um, develop when you have contention over outputs. If um, at any given point in time there, are, there is no contention, then things are relatively simple. And there's a further element that uh, makes life even more challenging for uh, switch development, which is the mix between unicast and multicast traffic. In the past, uh, multicast traffic in the Ethernet world uh, didn't used to be so popular. These days, it's becoming more and more popular. And uh, one of the more frequent pitfalls in switch, uh, uh, in switch components design is to not pay attention in the way that the multicast and unicast traffic are um, interleaved or, or scheduled uh, within uh, a switch implementation. Uh, unicast traffic is very nice in a way because um, uh, there's so much work that a single packet that comes in can generate. Multicast packets are, uh, tend to be a little bit uh, nastier because a single packet that came in uh, generates or potentially can generate a lot of work. And this lot of work that the multicast uh, traffic generates manifests itself both in the data plane and the control plane. In the data plane, uh, you have a, a piece of, of data that needs to be replicated, uh, potentially, in this case, up to 64 times. Uh, think of uh, the complexity associated with that in terms of access to your uh, on-chip buffers. On the control plane, uh, things are uh, even harder because uh, one of the uh, most important uh, performance metrics associated with this uh, kind of devices is the, uh, the message rate, the packet rate that you can generate. And this is uh, a, lot, uh, a lot of times associated with the uh, ability of your control plane to be able to deal with the queuing and dequeuing of packet descriptors. Now, as I said, unicast is relatively easy. Every packet that comes in needs to be queued once. A multicast packet needs to be queued multiple times. So all the synchronization of your data structures needs to take into account uh, those uh, generally uh, nasty cases. Just to summarize, uh, SwitchX uh, as a component that um, can be used to build um, systems that range from uh, one new devices with uh, very flexible uh, selection of uh, links, uh, speeds, and types. Uh, typical implementations here shown where, for example, we have a 64-port, uh, 10 gigabit uh, Ethernet switch, or a 48-port, 10 gigabit Ethernet switch with <coughs> 12 uh, 40 gigabit uh, Ethernet um, uplinks. Um, and all the way to big modular designs that uh, can go in a, in a single, uh, in a single uh, enclosure all the way to uh, 648, uh, 40, uh, 40 gigabit Ethernet ports, or uh, roughly 1,100 uh, 10 gigabit SFP plus uh, ports um, in a, within a single uh, chassis. Thanks. Uh, hi, Jeff Becker from uh, NASA Advanced Supercomputing. Um, so I wanted to know a little more about the um, on-chip buffering and you know, allocation of buffers am among flows, and also um, for for long distance uh, applications, do you do you do like buffer coalescing or something like that? Or um... okay, so uh, let me start with the second part of the of the question. Uh, one of the things uh, that um, are critical in the long distance uh, typically have to do with the link level flow control, whether you have it or not. Mm -hmm. If you don't have link level flow control, then uh, there's not much to talk about. If you do have link level flow control in the long distances, uh, then uh, it's one of the cases where credit-based uh, flow control has the ability to uh, extend um, 
you know, to, to preserve correctness of the protocol at unlimited distance, but uh, to limit the, the throughput that you're going to have based on the size of your buffer. And yes, uh, for that, we have a way to coalesce uh, buffer space uh, so that we can significantly uh, increase the distances. As for your uh, first question, um, we do not uh, openly disclose the way we uh, manage uh, our buffer space uh, on, uh, on this chip. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Satoshi Matsushita, NEC. And uh, with the configuration of the FAT tree, FAT tree configuration, how the uh, edge switch de de uh, decide the, the port for the core switch? That does it, do, do, we, do we assume the open flow or some flow table com control? So, so we, have, uh, we have essentially um, two ways that uh, this can be done. One is deterministic destination-based uh, forwarding. So you spread your traffic across based on the destination. Uh, and and uh, when I say destination, it's not really only the destination address. You can do any kind of hash based on any kind of bits that you want. So you can distribute your load. Uh, accordingly. Uh, we have another mechanism implemented in this device that is called adaptive routing, where you can take the routing decision based on the load, dynamic load uh, of the fabric uh, at, the, at that given point in time. Is, is that adaptive one is uh, or, uh, implemented in the, the, the by the port? It's, it, it's in, in the, the, or the implemented in the switch. It's implemented in the silicon component. It's a mechanism that can uh, take into account the Q length, the, the Q depth in the multiple directions to uh, make uh, decisions about changing the routing of, of a particular hash. Thank you. Bob Felderman from Google. Um, in your stacking protocol, do you simply use InfiniBand for that, or do you use Ethernet when you're stacking Ethernets and Fiber Channel when you're stacking Fiber Channels? Uh, we, we use a proprietary protocol that it's awfully close to Ethernet for stacking. This is for when we're doing stacking of an Ethernet uh, switch. In InfiniBand, the concept of stacking is a little bit different because it's built in into the protocol, so there's really no stacking in InfiniBand. It's just InfiniBand all the way across. Let's thank the speaker and I have a couple comments. Thank you.